Chapter 25. Percy. Percy already felt like the lamest demigod in the history of lame. The bag was the final insult. They'd left ROFL in a hurry, so maybe Iris hadn't meant the bag as a criticism. She'd quickly stuffed it with vitamin-enriched pastries, dried fruit leather, macrobiotic beef jerky, and a few crystals for good luck. Then she'd chubbed it at Percy. Here, you'll need this. Oh, that looks good. The handbag, uh, sorry, masculine accessory bag, was rainbow tie-dyed with a piece of symbol stitched in wooden beads and the slogan, Hug the Whole World. Percy wished it said, Hug the Commode. He felt like the bag was a comment on his massive, incredible uselessness. As they sailed north, he put the man satchel as far away from him as he could, but the boat was small. He couldn't believe how he'd broken down when his friends had needed him. First, he'd been dumb enough to leave them alone when he had run back to the boat, and Hazel had been kidnapped. Then he'd watched that army marching south and had some kind of nervous breakdown. Embarrassing? Yeah, but he couldn't help it. When he'd seen those evil centaurs and cyclopses, it had seemed so wrong, so backwards, that he thought his head would explode. And the giant Polybitus, the giant had given him a feeling the opposite of what he felt when he stood in the ocean. Percy's energy had drained out of him, leaving him weak and feverish, like his insides were eroding. Iris's medicinal tea had helped his body feel better, but his mind still hurt. He'd heard stories about amputees who had phantom pains where their missing legs and arms used to be. That's how his mind felt, like his missing memories were aching. Worst of all, the further north Percy went, the more these memories faded. He had started to feel better at Camp Jupiter, remembering random names and faces, but now even Annabeth's face was getting dimmer. At ROFL, when he tried to send an iris message to Annabeth, Fleecy had just shaken her head sadly. It's like you're dialing somebody, she said, but you've forgotten the number, or someone is jamming the signal. Sorry, dear, I just can't connect you. He was terrified that he'd lose Annabeth's face completely when he got to Alaska. Maybe he'd wake up one day and not remember her name. Still, he had to con concentrate on the quest. The sight of that enemy army had shown him what they were up against. It was early in the morning of the 21st of June now. They had to get to Alaska, find Fanatos, locate the Legion Standard, and make it back to Camp Jupiter by the evening of the 24th of June. Four days. Meanwhile, the enemy had only a few hundred miles to march. Percy guided the boat through the strong currents of the northern California coast. The wind was cold, but it felt good. Clearing some of the confusion from his head, he bent his will to push the boat as hard as he could. The hull rattled as the packs ploughed its way north. Meanwhile, Hazel and Frank traded stories about the events at Rainbow Organic Foods. Frank explained about the blind seer Phineas in Portland, and how Iris had said that he might be able to tell them where to find Fanatos. Frank wouldn't say how he had managed to kill the basilisks, but Percy got the feeling it had something to do with the broken point of his spear. Whatever had happened, Frank sounded more scared of the spear than the basilisks. When he was done, Hazel told Frank about their time with Fleecy. So, this Iris message worked? Frank asked. Hazel gave Percy a sympathetic look. She didn't mention his failure to contact Annabeth. I got in touch with Raina, she said. You're supposed to throw a coin into a rainbow and say this incantation like, Oh, Iris, goddess of the rainbow, accept my offering. Except Fleecy kind of changed it. She gave us her, uh, what did she call it? Her direct number. So I had to say, oh, Fleecy, do me a solid. Show Raina at Camp Jupiter. I felt kind of stupid, but it worked. Raina's image appeared in the rainbow, like in a two-way video call. She was in the baths, scared her out of her mind. That I would have paid to see, Frank said. I mean, her expression, not, you know, the baths. Frank. Hazel fanned her face like she needed air. It was an old-fashioned gesture, her, but cute somehow. Anyway, we told Raina about the army, but like Percy said, she pretty much already knew. It doesn't change anything. She's doing what she can to shore up the defences, unless we unleash death and get back from the get back with the eagle. The camp can't stand against that army, Frank finished, not without help. After that, they sailed in silence. Percy kept thinking about cyclopses and centaurs. He thought about Annabeth, the satyr Grover, and his dream of a giant warship under construction. You come from somewhere, Rayner had said. Percy wished he could remember. He could call for help. Camp Jupiter shouldn't have to fight alone against the giants. There must be allies out there. He fingered the beads on his necklace, the lead probatio tablet and the silver ring Rayner had given him. Maybe in Seattle, he'd be able to talk to her sister, his sister, Hilla. She might send help, assuming she didn't kill Percy on sight. After a few more hours of navigating, Percy's eyes started to droop. He was afraid he'd pass out from exhaustion. Then he caught a break. A killer whale surfaced next to the boat, and Percy struck up a mental conversation with him. 
It wasn't exactly like talking, but it went something like this. Could you give us a ride north? Percy asked, like as close to Portland as possible. Eat seals, the whale responded. Are you seals? No, Percy admitted. I've got a man satchel full of macrobiotic beef jerky, though. The whale shuddered. Promise not to feed me this and I will take you north. Deal. Soon Percy had made a makeshift rope harness and strapped it round the whale's upper body. They sped north under whale power and, at Hazel and Frank's insistence, Percy settled in for a nap. His dreams were as disjointed and scary as ever. He imagined himself on Mount Tamalpais, north of San Francisco, fighting at the old Titan stronghold. That didn't make sense. He hadn't been with the Romans when they had attacked, but he saw it all clearly. A Titan in armour, Annabeth and two other girls fighting at Percy's side. One of the girls died in the battle. Percy knelt over her, watching as she dissolved into stars. Then he saw the giant warship in its dry dock. The bronze dragon figurehead glinted in the morning light. The riggings and ornaments were complete, but something was wrong. A hatch in the deck was open and smoke poured from some kind of engine. A boy with curly black hair was cursing as he pounded the engine with a wrench. Two other demigods squatted next to him, watching with concern. One was a teenage guy with short blonde hair. The other was a girl with long dark hair. You realise it's the solstice, the girl said. We're supposed to leave today. I know that. The curly-haired mechanic whacked the engine a few more times. Could be the fizz rockets. Could be the uh, samaflange. Could be Gaia messing with us again. I'm not sure. How long? The blonde guy asked. Two, three days? They may not have that long, the girl warned. Something told Percy that she meant Camp Jupiter. Then the scene shifted again. He saw a boy and his dog roaming over the yellow hills of California. But as the image became clearer, Percy realised it wasn't a boy. It was a cyclops in ragged jeans and a flannel shirt. The dog was a shambling mountain of black fur, easily as big as a rhino. The cyclops carried a massive club over his shoulder, but Percy didn't feel that he was an enemy. He kept yelling Percy's name, calling him, Brother! He smells further away, the cyclops moaned to the dog. Why does he smell further? Ruff! the dog barked, and Percy's dream changed again. He saw a range of snowy mountains, so tall they broke the clouds. Gaia's sleeping face appeared in the shadows of the rocks. Such a valuable pawn, she said soothingly. Do not fear, Percy Jackson. Come north. Your friends will die, yes, but I will preserve you for now. I have great plans for you. In a valley between the mountains lay a massive field of ice. The edge plunged into the sea, hundreds of feet below, with sheets of frost constantly crumbling into the water. On top of the ice field stood a legion camp, ramparts, moats, towers, barracks, just like Camp Jupiter except three times as large. At the crossroads outside the Principia, a figure in dark robes stood shackled to the ice. Percy's vision swept past him, into the headquarters. There in the gloom sat a giant even bigger than Polybatus. His skin glinted gold. Displayed behind him were the tattered, frozen banners of a Roman legion, including a large golden eagle with its wings spread. We await you. The giant's voice boomed. While you fumble your way north, trying to find me, my armies will destroy your precious camps. First the Romans, then the others. You cannot win, little demigod. Percy lurched awake in a cold grey daylight, rain falling on his face. I thought, I slept heavily, Hazel said. Welcome to Portland. Percy sat up and blinked. The scene around him was so different from his dream that he wasn't sure which was real. The packs floated on an iron black river through the middle of a city. Heavy clouds hung low overhead. The cold rain was so light it seemed suspended in the air. On Percy's left were industrial warehouses and railroad tracks. To his right were a small downtown area. An almost cosy looking cluster of towers between the banks of the river and a line of misty forested hills. Percy rubbed the sleep out of his eyes. How did we get here? Frank gave him a little, a little look. You won't believe this. The killer whale took us as far as the Columbia River, and then he passed the harness to a couple of twelve-foot sturgeons. Percy thought Frank had said, surgeons. He had this weird image of giant doctors in scrubs and face masks, pulling their boat upstream. Then he realised Frank meant sturgeons, like the fish. He was glad he hadn't said anything. Would have been embarrassing, his being the son of a sea god and all. Anyway, Frank continued, the sturgeons pulled us for a long time. Hazel and I took turns sleeping. Then we hit this river. The Willamette, Hazel offered. Frank, right, Frank said. After that, the boat kind of took over and navigated us here all by itself. Sleep okay? As the packs glided south, Percy told them about his dreams. 
he tried to focus on the positive. A warship might be on the way to help Camp Jupiter. A friendly cyclops and a giant dog were looking for him. He didn't mention what Gaia had said. Your friends will die. When Percy described the Roman fort on the ice, Hazel looked troubled. So, Alsonius is on a glacier, she said. That doesn't narrow it down much. Alaska has hundreds of those. Percy nodded. Maybe this seer dude, Phineas, can tell us which one. The boat docked itself at a wharf. The three demigods stared up at the buildings of drizzly downtown Portland. Frank wiped the rain off his flat-top hair. So now we find a blind man in the rain, Frank said. Yay! Chapter 26. Percy. It wasn't as hard as they'd thought. The screaming and the weed whacker helped. They brought lightweight Polytech jackets with their supplies, so they bundled up against the cold rain and walked for a few blocks through the mostly deserted streets. This time Percy was smart and brought most of his supplies from the boat. He even stuffed the macrobiotic jerky in his coat pocket in case he needed to threaten any more killer whales. They saw some bicycle traffic and a few homeless guys huddled in doorways, but the majority of Portlanders seemed to be staying indoors. As they made their way down Glisten Street, Percy looked longingly at the folks in the cafes enjoying coffee and pastries. He was about to suggest that they stop for breakfast when he heard a voice down the street yelling, Ha! Take that, stupid chickens! followed by the revving of a small engine and a lot of squawking. Percy glanced at his friends. You think? Probably, Frank agreed. They ran towards the sounds. The next block over, they found a big open parking lot with tree-lined sidewalks and rows of food trucks facing the streets on all four sides. Percy had seen food trucks before, but never so many in one place. Some were simple white metal boxes on wheels with awnings and serving counters. Others were painted blue or purple or polka dotted with big banners out front and colourful menu boards and tables like do-it-yourself sidewalk cafes. One advertised Korean-Brazilian fusion tacos, which sounded like some kind of top-secret radioactive cuisine. Another offered sushi on a stick. A third was selling deep-fried ice cream sandwiches. The smell was amazing. Dozens of different kitchens cooking at once. Percy's stomach rumbled. Most of the food carts were open for business, but there was hardly anyone around. They could get anything they wanted. Deep fried ice cream sandwiches? Oh man, that sounded way better than wheat germ. Unfortunately, there was more happening than just cooking. In the centre of the lot, behind all the food trucks, an old man in a bathrobe was running around with a weed whacker, screaming at a flock of bird ladies who were trying to steal food off a picnic table. Harpies, said Hazel, which means... That's Phineas, Frank guessed. They ran across the street and squeezed between the Korean-Brazilian truck and a Chinese egg roll burrito vendor. The backs of the food trucks weren't nearly as appetising as the fronts. They were cluttered with stacks of plastic buckets, overflowing garbage cans and makeshift clotheslines hung with wet aprons and towels. The parking lot itself was nothing but a square of cracked asphalt, part marbled with weeds. In the middle was a picnic table piled high with food from all the different trucks. The guy in the bathrobe was, robe was old and fat. He was mostly bald, with scars across his forehead and a rim of stringy white hair. His bathrobe was spattered with ketchup, and he kept stumbling around in fuzzy pink bunny slippers, swinging his gas-powered weed whacker at the half-dozen harpies who were hovering over his picnic table. He was clearly blind. His eyes were milky white, and usually he missed the harpies by a lot, but he was still doing a pretty good job fending them off. "'Back, dirty chickens!' he bellowed. Percy wasn't sure why, but he had a vague sense that harpies were supposed to be plumped. Those looked like they were starving. Their human faces had sunken eyes and hollow cheeks. Their bodies were covered in molting feathers, and their wings were tipped with tiny shriveled hands. They wore ragged burlap sacks for dresses. As they dived for the food, they seemed more desperate than angry. Percy felt sorry for them. <laughs> the old man swung his weed whacker. He grazed one of the harpies' wings. The harpy yelped in pain and fluttered off, dropping yellow fe feathers as she flew. Another harpy circled higher than the rest. She looked younger and smaller than the others, with bright red feathers. She watched carefully for an opening, and when the old man's back was turned, she made a wild dive for the table. She grabbed a burrito in her clawed feet, but before she could escape, the blind man swung his weed whacker and smacked her in the back so hard that Percy winced. The harpy yelped, dropped the burrito and flew off. Hey, stop it, Percy yelled. The harpies took that the wrong way. They glanced over at the three demigods and immediately fled. Most of them fluttered away and perched in the trees around the square, staring dejectedly at the picnic table. The red feathered one with the hurt back flew unsteadily down Glisten Street and out of sight. Ha! 
the blind man yelled in triumph and killed the power of his weed whacker. He grinned vacantly in Percy's direction. Thank you, strangers. Your help is most appreciated. Percy bit back his anger. He hadn't meant to help the old man, but he remembered that they needed information from him. Uh, whatever. He approached the old guy, keeping one eye on the weed whacker. I'm Percy Jackson. This is... Demigods, the old man said. I can always smell demigods. Hazel frowned. Do we smell that bad? The old man laughed. Of course not, my dear, but you'd be surprised how sharp any of our senses become when, when one is blinded. I'm Phineas, and you, wait, don't tell me. He reached for Percy's face and poked him in the eyes. Ow, Percy complained. Son of Neptune, Phineas exclaimed. Thought I smelled the ocean on you, Percy Jackson. I'm also a son of Neptune, you know. Hey, yeah, okay. Percy rubbed his eyes. Just his luck he was related to this grubby old dude. He hoped all sons of Neptune didn't share the same fate. First you start crying, carrying a man satchel, and next thing you know you're running around in a bathrobe and pink bunny slippers chasing chickens with a weed whacker. Phineas turned to Hazel. And here, oh my, the smell of gold and deep earth. Hazel Levesque, daughter of Pluto. And next to you, the son of Mars. But there's more to your story, Frank Zhang. Ancient blood, Frank muttered. Prince of Pylos, uh, blah, blah, blah. Perislimius, <laughs> exactly. Oh, he was a nice fellow. I loved the Argonauts. Frank's mouth fell open. W -w Wait, Perry who? Phineas grinned. Don't worry, I know about your family. That story about your great-grandfather, he didn't really destroy the camp. Now, what an interesting group. Are you hungry? Frank looked like he'd been run over by a truck, but Phineas had already moved on to other matters. He waved his hand at the picnic table. In the nearby trees, the harpy shrieked miserably. As hungry as Percy was, he couldn't stand to think about eating with those poor bird ladies watching him. Look, I'm confused, Percy said. We need some information. We were told that the harpies were keeping my food away from me, Phineas finished, and if you helped me, I'd help you. Something like that, Percy admitted. Phineas laughed. That's old news. Do I look like I'm missing any meals? He patted his belly, which was the size of an overinflated basketball. Um, no, Percy said. Phineas waved his weed whacker in an expansive gesture. All three of them ducked. Things have changed, my friends, he said. When I first got the gift of prophecy, eons ago, it's true Jupiter cursed me. He sent the harpies to steal my food. You see, I had a bit of a big mouth. I gave away too many secrets that the gods wanted kept. He turned to Hazel. For instance, you're supposed to be dead. And you, he turned to Frank. Your life depends on a burnt stick. Percy frowned. What are you talking about? Hazel blinked like she'd been slapped. Frank looked like the truck had backed up and run over him again. And you? Phineas turned to Percy. Well now, you don't even know who you are. I could tell you, of course, but ha, <laughs> what fun would that be? And Bridget O'Shaughnessy shot Miles Archer in the Maltese Falcon. And Darth Vader is actually Luke's father. And the winner of the next Super Bowl will be... Got it, Frank muttered. Hazel gripped his, her sword like she was tempted to pommel whip the old man. So you talk too much and the gods curse you. Why did they stop? Oh, they didn't. The old man arched his bushy eyebrows like, can you believe it? I had to make a deal with the Argonauts. They wanted information too, you see. I told them to kill the harpies and I'd cooperate. Well, they drove those nasty creatures away, but Iris wouldn't let them kill the harpies. An outrage. So this time, when my patron brought me back to life. Your patron? Frank asked. Phineas gave him a wicked grin. Why, Gaia, of course. Who do you think opened the doors of death? Your girlfriend here understands. Isn't Gaia your patron too? Hazel drew her sword. I'm not his. I don't... Gaia, Gaia is not my patron. Phineas looked amused. If he had heard the sword being drawn, he didn't seem concerned. Fine. If you want to be noble and stick with the losing side, that's your business. But Gaia is waking. She's already rewritten the rules of life and death. I'm alive again. In exchange for my help, a prophecy here, a prophecy there, I get my fondest wish. The tables have been turned, so to speak. Now I can eat all I want all day long, and the harpies have to watch and starve. He revved his weed whacker, and the harpies wailed in the trees. They're cursed, the old man said. They can eat only food from my table, and they can't leave Portland. Since the doors of death are open, they can't even die. It's beautiful. Beautiful, Frank protested. They're living creatures. Why are you so mean to them? They're monsters, Phineas said. And mean? Those feather-brained demons tormented me for years. But it was their duty, Percy said, trying to control himself. Jupiter ordered them to. 
Oh, I'm mad at Jupiter too, Phineas agreed. In time, Gaia will see that the gods are properly punished. Horrible job they've done ruling the world. But for now, I'm enjoying Portland. The mortals take no, no, no notice of me. They think I'm just a crazy old man shooing away pigeons. Hazel advanced on the seer. You're awful, she told Phineas. You belong in the fields of punishment. Phineas sneered. One dead person to another, girlie? I wouldn't be talking. You started this whole thing. If it weren't for you, Alsonius wouldn't be alive. Hazel stumbled back. Hazel? Frank's eyes got as wide as quarters. What's he talking about? Ha! Phineas said. You'll find out soon enough. Frank Zhang, then we'll see if you're still sweet on your girlfriend. But that's not what you're here about, is it? You want to find Fanatos. He's being kept at Alsonius' lair. I can tell you where that is. Of course I can. But you'll have to do me a favour. Forget it, Hazel snapped. You're working for the enemy. We should send you back to the underworld ourselves. You could try, Phineas smiled. But I doubt I'd stay dead very long. You see, Gaia has shown me the easy way back. And with Fanatos in chains, there's no way to keep me down. Besides, if you kill me, you won't get my secrets. Percy was tempted to let Hazel use her sword. In fact, he wanted to strangle the old man himself. Camp Jupiter, he told himself. Saving the camp is more important. He remembered Alsonius taunting him in his dreams. If they wasted time searching through Alaska looking for the giant's lair, Gaia's armies would destroy the Romans and Percy's other friends, who were wherever they were. He gritted his teeth. What's the favour? Phineas licked his lips greedily. Ah, there's one harpy who's quicker than the rest. The red one, Percy guessed. I'm blind, I don't know colours, the old man groused. At any rate, she's the only one I have trouble with. She's wily, that one. Always does her own thing, never roosts with the others. She gave me these. He pointed at the scars on his forehead. Capture that harpy, he said. Bring her to me. I want her tied up where I can keep an eye on her, uh, so to speak. Harpies hate being tied up. It causes them extreme pain. Yes, I'll enjoy that. Maybe I'll even feed her so that she lasts longer. Percy looked at his friends. They came to a silent agreement. They would never help this creepy old man. On the other hand, they had to get his information. They needed a plan B. Oh, go talk among yourselves, Phineas said breezily. I don't care. Just remember that without my help, your quest will fail and everyone you love in the world will die. Now, off with you. Bring me a harpy. Chapter 27. Percy. We'll need some of your food. Percy shouldered his way around the old man and snatched stuff off the picnic table. A covered bowl of Thai noodles in mac and cheese sauce and a tubular pastry that looked like a combination burrito and cinnamon roll. Before he could lose control and smash the burrito in Phineas's face, Percy said, Come on, guys. He led his friends out of the parking lot. They stopped across the street. Percy took a deep breath, trying to calm down. The rain had slowed to a half-hearted drizzle. The cold mist felt good on his face. That man. Hazel smacked the side of a bus stop bench. He needs to die again. It was hard to tell in the rain, but she seemed to be blinking back tears. Her long curly hair was plastered down the sides of her face. In the grey light, her gold eyes looked more like tin. Percy remembered how confident she'd acted when they first met, taking control of the situation with the Gorgons and ushering him to safety. She'd comforted him at the shrine of Neptune and made him feel welcome at camp. Now he wanted to return the favour, but he wasn't sure how. She looked lost, bedraggled and thoroughly depressed. Percy wasn't surprised that she had come back from the underworld. He'd suspected that for a while, the way she avoided talking about her past, the way Nico D'Angelo had been so secretive and cautious. But that didn't change how Percy saw her. She seemed, well, alive, like a regular kid with a good heart, who deserved to grow up and have a future. She wasn't a ghoul like Phineas. We'll get him, Percy promised. He's nothing like you, Hazel. I don't care what he says. She shook her head. You don't know the whole story. I should have been sent to punishment. I, I'm just as bad. No, you're not. Frank bored his fists. He looked around like he was searching for anybody who might disagree with him. Enemies he could hit for Hazel's sake. She's a good person, he yelled across the street. A few harpies squawked in the trees, but no one else paid them any attention. Hazel stared at Frank. She reached out tentatively, as if she wanted to take his hand, but was afraid he might evaporate. Frank, she stammered. I... I don't... Unfortunately, Frank seemed wrapped up in his own thoughts. He slung his spear off his back and gripped it uneasily. I could intimidate that old man, he offered. Maybe scare him. Frank, it's okay, Percy said. Let's keep that as a backup plan. But I don't think Phineas can be scared into cooperating. Besides, you've only got two more uses of that spear, right? 
Frank scowled at the dragon's tooth point, which had grown back completely overnight. Yeah, I guess. Percy wasn't sure what the old seer had meant about Frank's family history, his great-grandfather destroying camp, his Argonaut ancestor, and the bit about a burnt stick controlling Frank's life, but it had clearly shaken Frank up. Percy decided not to ask for explanations. He didn't want the big guy reduced to tears, especially in front of Hazel. I've got an idea. Percy pointed up the street. The red-feathered harpy went that way. Let's see if we can get her to talk to us. Hazel looked at the food in his hands. You're going to use that as bait? More like a peace offering, Percy said. Come on, just try to keep the other harpies from stealing this stuff, okay? Percy uncovered the Thai noodles and unwrapped the cinnamon burrito. Fragrant steam wafted into the air. They walked down the street, Hazel and Frank with their weapons out. The harpies fluttered after them, perching on trees, mailboxes and flagpoles, following the smell of food. Percy wondered what the mortals saw through the mist. Maybe they thought the harpies were pigeons and the weapons were lacrosse sticks or something. Maybe they just thought the Thai mac and cheese was so good it needed an armed escort. Percy kept a tight grip on the food. He'd seen how quickly the harpies could snatch things. He didn't want to lose his peace offering before he found the red feathered harpy. Finally, he spotted her, circling above a stretch of parkland that ran for several blocks between rows of old stone buildings. Paths stretched through the park, under huge, ma huge maple and elm trees, past sculptures and playgrounds and shady benches. The place reminded Percy of some other park, maybe in his hometown? He couldn't remember, but it made him feel homesick. They crossed the street and found a bench to sit on, next to a big bronze sculpt sculpture of an elephant. Looks like Hannibal, Hazel said, except it's Chinese, Frank said. My grandmother has one of those. He flinched. I mean, hers isn't 12 feet tall, but she imports stuff from China. We're Chinese. He looked at Hazel and Percy, who were trying hard not to laugh. Could I just die from embarrassment now? He asked. Don't worry about it, man, Percy said. Let's see if we can make friends with the harpy. He raised the Thai noodles and fanned the smell upward, spicy peppers and cheesy goodness. The red harpy circled lower. We won't hurt you, Percy called up in a normal voice. We just want to talk. Thai noodles for a chance to talk, okay? The harpy streaked down in a flash of red and landed on the elephant statue. She was painfully thin. Her feathery legs were like sticks. Her face would have been pretty except for her sunken cheeks. She moved in jerky bird-like twitches, her coffee brown eyes darting restlessly, her fingers clawing at her plumage, her earlobes, her shaggy red hair. Cheese, she muttered, looking sideways. Ella doesn't like cheese. Percy hesitated. Your name is Ella. Ella, Ella, harpy in English, in Latin. Ella doesn't like cheese. She said all that without taking a breath or making eye contact. Her hand snatched at her hair, her burlap dress, the raindrops, whatever moved. Quicker than Percy could blink, she lunged, snatched the cinnamon burrito and appeared atop the elephant again. God, she's fast, Hazel said, and heavily caffeinated, Frank guessed. Ella sniffed the burrito. She nibbled at the edge and shuddered from head to foot, cawing like she was dying. Cinnamon is good, she pronounced. Good for harpies. Yum. She started to eat, but the bigger harpies swooped down. Before Percy could react, they began pummeling Ella with their wings, snatching at the burrito. No, no. Ella tried to hide under her wings as her sisters ganged up on her, scratching with their claws. No, no, she stuttered. No, 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 no. Stop it, Percy yelled. He and his friends ran to help, but it was too late. A big yellow harpy grabbed the burrito and the whole flock scattered, leaving Ella cowering and shivering on top of the elephant. Hazel touched the harpy's foot. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Ella poked her head out of her wings. She was still trembling. With her shoulders hunched, Percy could see the bleeding gash on her back where Phineas had hit her with the weed whacker. She picked at her feathers, pulling out tufts of plumage. S -s Small Ella, she stuttered angrily. W weak Ella. No cinnamon for Ella. Only cheese. Frank glared across the street, where the other harpies were sitting in a maple tree, tearing the burrito to shreds. We'll get you something else, he promised. Percy set down the, the Thai noodles. He realised that Ella was different, even for a harpy. But after watching her get picked on, he was sure of one thing. Whatever else happened, he was going to help her. Ella, he said, we want to be your friends. We can get you more food, but... Friends, Ella said. Ten seasons, 1994 to 2004... She glanced sideways at Percy and then looked in the air and started reciting to the clouds. A half-blood of the eldest gods shall reach sixteen against all odds. Sixteen, you're sixteen, page sixteen, mastering the art of French cooking, ingredients, bacon, butter. 
Percy's ears were ringing. He felt dizzy, like he'd just plunged a hundred feet underwater and backed up again. Ella, what was that you said? Bacon. She caught a raindrop out of the air. Butter. No, before that, those lines. I know those lines. Next to him, Hazel shivered. It does sound familiar, like, I don't know, like a prophecy. Maybe it's something she heard Phineas say. At the name Phineas, Ella squawked in terror and flew away. Wait, Hazel called. I didn't mean, oh gods, I'm stupid. It's all right, Frank pointed. Look, Ella wasn't moving as quickly now. She flapped her way to the top of the three-storey red brick building and scuttled out of sight over the roof. A single red feather fluttered down to the street. You think that's her nest? Frank squinted at the sign on the building. Multima County Library. Percy nodded. Let's see if it's open. They ran across the street and into the lobby. A library wouldn't have been Percy's first choice for some place to visit. With his dyslexia, he had enough trouble reading signs. A whole building full of books? That sounded almost as much fun as Chinese water torture or getting his teeth extracted. As they jogged through the lobby, Percy figured Annabeth would like this place. It was spacious and brightly lit, with big vaulted windows, books and architecture. That was definitely her. He froze in his tracks. Percy? Frank asked. What's wrong? Percy tried desperately to concentrate. Where had those forts come from? Architecture, books. Annabeth had taken him in the library once. Back home in the... The memory faded. Percy slammed his fist into the side of a bookshelf. Percy? Hazel asked gently. He was so angry, so frustrated with his missing memories that he wanted to punch another bookshelf, but his friend's concerned faces brought him back to the present. I'm... I'm all right, he lied. Just got dizzy for a sec. Let's find a way to the roof. It took them a while, but they finally found a stairwell with roof access. At the top was a door with a handle alarm, but someone had propped it open with a copy of War and Peace. Outside, Ella the harpy huddled in a nest of books under a makeshift cardboard shelter. Percy and his friends advanced slowly, trying not to scare her. Ella didn't pay them much, any attention. She picked at her feathers and muttered under her breath like she was practicing lines for a play. Percy got within five feet and knelt down. Hi, uh, sorry we scared you. Look, I don't have much food, but... He took some of the macrobiotic jerky out of his pocket. Ella lunged and snatched it immediately. She huddled back in her nest, sniffing the jerky, but sighed and tossed it away. No, not from his table. Ella cannot eat. Sad. Jerky would be good for harpies. Not from... Oh, right, Percy said. That's part of the curse. You can only eat his food. There has to be a way, Hazel said. Photosynthesis? Ella muttered. Noun, biology, the synthesis of complex organic materials. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. What is she saying? Frank whispered. Percy stared at the mound of books around her. They all looked old and mildewed. Some, some had prices written in markers in the covers, like the library had got rid of them in a clearance sale. She's quoting books, Percy guessed. Farmer's Almanac, 1965, Ella said. St start breeding animals, January the 26th. Ella, he said, have you read all of these? She blinked. More, more downstairs. Words, words calm Ella down. Words, words, words. Percy picked up a book at random, a tattered copy of a history of horse racing. Ella, do you remember the um third paragraph on page 62? Secretariat. Ella said instantly, favoured three to two in the 1973 Kentucky Derby, finished at Standing Rock, record of 159 and two-fifths. Percy closed his book. His hands were shaking. Word, the word, word for word. That's amazing, Hazel said. She's a genius chicken, Frank agreed. Percy felt uneasy. He was starting to form a terrible idea about why Phineas wanted to capture Ella, and it wasn't because she'd scratched him. Percy remembered that line she'd recited, a half-blood of the eldest gods. He was sure it was about him. Ella, he said, we're going to find a way to break the curse. Would you like that? It's impossible, she said. Recorded in English by Perry Como, 1970. Nothing's impossible, Percy said. Now look, I'm going to say his name. You don't have to run away. We're going to save you from the curse. We just need to figure out a way to beat Phineas. He waited for her to bolt. But she just shook her head vigorously. No, 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 Phineas. Ella is quick, too quick for him. But but he wants to ch chain Ella. He, he hurts Ella. She tried to reach the gash on her back. Frank, Percy said. You have first aid supplies? On it. Frank brought out a thermos full of nectar and explained its healing properties to Ella. When he scooted closer, she recoiled and started to shriek. Then Hazel tried, and Ella let her pour some nectar on her back. The wound began to close. 
Hazel smiled. See? That's better. Phineas is bad, Ella insisted. And weed whackers. And cheese. Absolutely, Percy agreed. We won't let him hurt you again. We need to figure out how to trick him, though. You harpies must know him better than anybody. Is there any way we can trick him? N no, Ella said. Tricks are for kids. Fifty tricks to teach your dog by Sophie Collins. Call number 636. Okay, Ella. Hazel spoke in a soothing voice, like she was trying to calm a horse. But does Phineas have any weaknesses? Blind. He's blind. Frank rolled his eyes, but Hazel continued patiently. Right, besides that. Chance, she said. Games of chance. Two to one. Bad odds. Call or fold. Percy's spirits rose. You mean he's a gambler? Phineas s s sees big things, prophecies, fates, God stuff, not small stuff, random, exciting, and he is blind. Frank rubbed his chin. Any idea what she means? Percy watched the harpy pick up her burlap dress. He felt incre incredibly sorry for her, but he was also starting to realise just how smart she was. I think I get it, he said. Phineas sees the future. He knows tons of important events, but he can't see small things, like random occurrences, spontaneous games of chance. That makes gambling exciting for him. If we can tempt him into making a bet. Hazel nodded slowly. You mean, if he loses, he has to tell us where Fanatos is? But what do we have to wager? What kind of game do we play? Something simple, with high stakes, Percy said. Like two choices. One you live, one you die. And the prize has to be something Phineas wants. I mean, besides Ella. That's off the table. Sight, Ella muttered. Sight, sight is good for blind men. Healing, no, no. Gaia won't do that for Phineas. Gaia keeps Phineas b -b blind, d dependent on Gaia, yeah. Frank and Percy exchanged a meaningful look. Gorgon's blood, they said simultaneously. What? Hazel asked. Frank brought out the two ceramic vials he'd retrieved from the little, t li 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 little Tiber. Ella's a genius, he said. Unless we die. Don't worry about that, Percy said. I've got a plan. Chapter 28. Percy. The old man was right where they'd left him, in the middle of the food truck parking lot. He sat on his picnic bench with his bunny slippers propped up, eating a plate of greasy shish kebab. His weed whacker was at his side. His bathrobe was smeared with barbecue sauce. Welcome back, he called cheerfully. I hear the flutter of nervous little wings. You've brought me my harpy. She's here, Percy said, but she's not yours. Phineas sucked the grease off his fingers. His milky eyes seemed fixed on a point just above Percy's head. I see. Well, actually, I'm blind, so I don't see. Have you come to kill me, then? If so, good luck completing your quest. I've come to gamble. The old man's mouth twitched. He put down his shish kebab and leaned towards Percy. A gamble? How interesting. Information in exchange for the harpy. Winner take all? No, Percy said. The harpy isn't part of the deal. Phineas laughed. Really? Perhaps you don't understand her value. She's a person, Percy said. She isn't for sale. Oh, please. You're from the Roman camp, aren't you? Rome was built on slavery. Don't get all high and mighty with me. Besides, she isn't even human. She's a monster, a wind spirit, a minion of Jupiter. Ella squawked. Just getting her into the parking lot had been a major challenge, but now she started backing away, muttering, Jupiter, hydrogen and helium, uh, 63 satellites. No, no minions. No. Hazel put her arm around Ella's wings. She seemed to be the only one who could touch the harpy without causing lots of screaming and twitching. Frank stayed at Percy's side. He held his spear ready, as if the old man might charge them. Percy brought out the ceramic vials. I have a different wager. We've got two flasks of Gorgon's blood. One kills, one heals. They look exactly the same. Even we don't, even we don't know which is which. If you choose the right one, it could cure your blindness. Phineas held out his hands eagerly. Let me feel them. Let me smell them. Not so fast, Percy said. First, you agree to the terms. Terms. Phineas was breathing shallowly. Percy could tell he was hungry to take the offer. Prophecy and sight. I'd be unstoppable. I could own this city. I'd build my palace here, surrounded by food trucks. I could capture that harpy myself. No, 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 Ella said nervously. No, 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 no. A villainous laugh is hard to pull off when you're wearing pink bunny slippers, but Phineas gave it his best shot. Ha 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 ha! Very well, demigod. What are your terms? You get to choose a vial, Percy said. No uncorking, no sniffing before you decide. That's not fair, I'm blind. And I don't have your sense of smell, Percy countered. You can hold the vials, and I'll swear on the river sticks that they look identical. They're exactly what I told you, Gorgon's blood. 
One vial from the left side of the monster, one from the right, and I swear that none of us knows which is which. Percy looked back at Hazel. Uh, you're our underworld expert. With all this weird stuff going on with death, is an oath on the river stick still binding? Yes, she said, without hesitation. To break such a vow, well, just don't do it. There are worse things than death. Phineas stroked his beard. So I choose which vial to drink. You have to drink the other one. We swear to drink at the same time. Right, Percy said. The loser dies, obviously, Phineas said. That kind of poison would probably keep even me from coming back to life, for a long time at least. My essence would be scattered and degraded, so I'm risking quite a lot. But if you win, you get everything, Percy said. If I die, my friends will swear to leave you in peace and not take revenge. You'd have your sight back, which even Gaia won't give you. The old man's expression soured. Percy could tell he'd struck a nerve. Phineas wanted to see. As much as Gaia had given him, he resented being kept in the dark. If I lose, the old man said, I'll be dead, unable to give you information. How does that help you? Percy was glad he'd talked this through with his friends ahead of time. Frank had suggested the answer. You write down the location of Alsonius's lair ahead of time, Percy said. Keep it to yourself, but swear on the river Styx it's specific and accurate. You also have to swear that if you lose and die, the harpies will be released from their curse. Those are high stakes, Phineas grumbled. You face death, Percy Jackson. Wouldn't it be simpler just to hand over the harpy? Not an option. Phineas smiled slowly. You are starting to understand her worth. Once I have my sight, I'll capture her myself, you know. Whoever controls that harpy, well, I was a king once. This gamble could make me a king again. You're getting ahead of yourself, Percy said. Do we have a deal? Phineas tapped his nose thoughtfully. I can't foresee the outcome. Annoying how that works. A completely unexpected gamble. It makes the future cloudy. But I can tell you this, Percy Jackson, a bit of free advice. If you survive today, you're not going to like your future. A big sacrifice is coming and you won't have the courage to make it. That will cost you dearly. It will cost the world dearly. It might be easier if you just choose the poison. Percy's mouth tasted like Iris's sour green tea. He wanted to thank, think the old man was just psyching him out, but something told him the prediction was true. He remembered Juno's warning when he'd chosen to go to Camp Jupiter. You will feel pain, misery, and loss beyond anything you've ever known, but you might have a chance to save your old friends and family. In the trees around the parking lot, the harpies gathered to watch if they sensed what was at stake. Frank and Hazel studied Percy's face with concern. He'd assured them the odds weren't as bad as 50-50. He did have a plan. Of course, the plan could backfire. His chance of survival might be 100% or zero. He hadn't mentioned that. Do we have a deal? He asked again. Phineas grinned. I swear on the river sticks to abide by the terms, just as you have described them. Frank Zhang, you're the descendant of an Argonaut. I trust your word. If I win, do you and your friend Hazel swear to leave me in peace and not seek revenge? Frank's hands were clenched, so tight Percy thought he might break his gold spear, but he managed to grumble. I swear it on the river sticks. I also swear, Hazel said. Swear, Ella muttered. Swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon. Phineas laughed. In that case, find me something to write with. Let's get started. Frank borrowed a napkin and pen from a food truck vendor. Phineas scribbled something on the napkin and put it in his bathrobe pocket. I swear this is the location of Alsonius's lair, not that you'll live long enough to read it. Percy drew his sword and swept all the food off the picnic table. Phineas sat on one side. Percy sat on the other. Phineas held out his hands. Let me feel the vials. Percy gazed at the hills in the distance. He imagined the shadowy face of a sleeping woman. He sent his thoughts into the ground beneath him and hoped the goddess was listening. Okay, Gaia, he said. I'm calling your bluff. You say I'm a valuable pawn. You say you've got plans for me. Are you going to spare me until I make it north? Who's more valuable to you? Me or this old man? Because one of us is about to die. Phineas curled his fingers in a grasping motion. Losing your nerve, Percy Jackson? Let me have them. Percy passed him the vials. The old man compared their weight. He ran his fingers along the ceramic surfaces. Then he set them both on the table and rested one hand lightly on each. A tremor passed through the ground. A mild earthquake, just strong enough to make Percy's teeth chatter. Ella cawed nervously. The vial on the left seemed to shake light slightly more than the one on the right. Phineas grinned wickedly. He closed his fingers around the left-hand vial. You were a fool, Percy Jackson. I choose this one. Now we drink. Percy took the vial on the right. His teeth were chattering. The old man raised his vial. A toast to the sons of Neptune.
they both uncorked their vials and drank. Immediately, Percy doubled over, his throat burning, his mouth tasted like gasoline. Oh, gods, Hazel said behind him. Nope, Ella said. Nope, nope, nope. Percy's vision blurred. He could see Phineas grinning in triumph, sitting up straighter, blinking his eyes in anticipation. Yes, he cried. Any moment now, my sight will return. Percy had chosen wrong. He'd been stupid to take such a risk. He felt like broken glass was working its way through his stomach, into his intestines. Percy, Frank gripped his shoulders. Percy, you can't die. He gasped for breath, and suddenly his vision cleared. At the same moment, Phineas hunched over like he'd been punched. You, you can't, the old man wailed. Gaia, you, you. He staggered to his feet and stumbled away from the table, clutching his stomach. I'm too valuable. Steam came out of his mouth. A sickly yellow vapour rose from his ears, his beard, his blind eyes. Unfair, he screamed. You tricked me. He tried to claw the piece of paper out of his robe pocket, but his hands crumbled, his fingers turning to sand. Percy rose unsteadily. He didn't feel cured of anything in particular. His memory hadn't magically returned, but the pain had stopped. No one tricked you, Percy said. You made your choice freely, and I hold you to your oath. The blind king wailed in agony. He turned in a circle, steaming and slowly disintegrating, until there was nothing left but an old, stained bathrobe and a pair of bunny slippers. Those, Frank said, are the most disgusting spoils of war ever. A woman's voice spoke in Percy's mind. A gamble, Percy Jackson. It was a sleepy whisper, with just a hint of grudging admiration. You forced me to choose, and you are more important to my plans than the old seer, but do not press your luck. When your death comes, I promise, it will be much more painful than Gorgon's blood. Hazel prodded the robe with her sword. There was nothing underneath, no sign that Phineas was trying to reform. She looked at Percy in awe. That was either the bravest thing I've ever seen, or the stupidest. Frank shook his head in disbelief. Percy, how did you know? You were so confident he'd choose the poison. Gaia, Percy said, she wants me to make it to Alaska. She thinks, I'm not sure. She thinks she can use me as part of her plan. She influenced Phineas to choose the wrong vial. Frank stared in horror at the remains of the old man. Gaia would kill her own servant rather than you. That's what you were betting on. Plans, Ella muttered. Plans and plots. The lady in the ground. Big plans for Percy. Macrobiotic jerky for Ella. Percy handed her the whole bag of jerky and she squeaked with joy. Nope, 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 she muttered, half singing. Phineas, nope. Food and words for Ella. Yep. Percy crouched over the bathrobe and pulled the old man's note out of the pocket. It read, Hubbard Glacier. All that risk for two words. He handed the note to Hazel. I know where that is, she said. It's pretty famous, but we've got a long, long way to go. In the trees around the parking lot, the other harpies finally overcame their shock. They squawked with excitement and flew at the nearest food trucks, diving through the service windows and raiding the kitchens. Cooks shouted in many languages. Trucks ch shook back and forth. Feathers and food boxes flew everywhere. We'd better get back to the boat, Percy said. We're running out of time. Chapter 29. Hazel. Even before she got on the boat, Hazel felt queasy. She kept thinking about Phineas, with steam coming out of his eyes, his hands crumbling to dust. Percy had assured her that she wasn't like Phineas, but she was. She'd done something even worse than torment harpies. You started this whole thing, Phineas had said. If it weren't for you, Alsonius wouldn't be alive. As the boat sped down the Columbia River, Hazel tried to forget. She helped Ella make a nest out of old books and magazines they'd liberated from the library's recycling bin. They hadn't really planned on taking the harpy with them, but Ella acted like the matter was decided. Friends, she muttered. Ten seasons, 1994 to 2004. Friends, melt Phineas and give Ella jerky. Ella will go with her friends. Now she was roosting comfortably in the stern, nibbling bits of jerky and reciting random lines from Charles Dickens and fifty tricks to teach your dog. Percy knelt in the bow, steering them towards the ocean with his freaky mind-over-water powers. Hazel sat next to Frank on the centre bench, their shoulders touching, which made her feel as jittery as a harpy. She remembered how Frank stood up for her in Portland, shouting, She's a good person, like he was ready to take on anybody who denied it. She remembered the way he'd looked on the hillside in Mendocino, alone in a clearing of poisoned grass with his spear in hand, fires burning all around him and the ashes of three basilisks at his feet. A week ago, if someone had suggested that Frank was a child of Mars, Hazel would have laughed. Frank was much too sweet and gentle for that. 
She had always felt protective of him because of his clumsiness and his knack for getting into trouble. Since they'd, le since they'd left camp, she saw him differently. He had more courage than she'd realised. He was the one looking out for her. She had to admit that the change was kind of nice. The river widened into the ocean. The packs turned north. As they sailed, Frank kept her spirits up by telling her silly jokes. Why did the Minotaur cross the road? How many fawns does it take to change a light bulb? He pointed out buildings along the coastline that reminded him of places in Vancouver. The sky started to darken, the sea turning the same rusty colour as Ella's wings. 21st of June was almost over. The Feast of Fortuna would happen in the evening, exactly 72 hours from now. Finally, Frank brought out some food from his pack, sodas and muffins he'd scavenged from Phineas's table. He passed them around. It's okay, Hazel, he said quietly. My mum used to say you shouldn't try to carry a problem alone. But if you don't want to talk about it, that's okay. Hazel took a shaky breath. She was afraid to talk, not just because she was embarrassed. She didn't want to black out and slip into the past. You were right, she said. When you guessed I came back from the underworld. I'm, I'm an escapee. I shouldn't be alive. She felt like a dam had broken. The story flooded out. She explained how her mother had summoned Pluto and fallen in love with the god. She explained her mother's wish for all the riches in the earth and how that had turned into Hazel's curse. She described her life in New Orleans, everything except her boyfriend Sammy. Looking at Frank, she couldn't bring herself to talk about that. She described the voice and how Gaia had slowly taken over her mother's mind. She explained how they had moved to Alaska, how Hazel had helped to raise the giant Alsonius and how she had died, sinking the island into Resurrection Bay. She knew Percy and Ella were listening, but she spoke mostly to Frank. When she had finished, she was afraid to look at him. She waited for him to move away from her, maybe tell her she was a monster after all. Instead, he took her hand. You sacrificed yourself to stop the giant from waking. I could never be that brave. She felt her pulse throbbing in her neck. It wasn't bravery. I let my mother die. I cooperated with Gaia too long. I almost let her win. Hazel, said Percy, you stood up to a goddess all by yourself. You did the right. His voice trailed off as if he'd had an unpleasant thought. What happened in the underworld? I mean, after you died, you should have gone to Elysium. But if Nico brought you back, I didn't go to Elysium. Her mouth felt dry as sand. Please don't ask. But it was too late. She remembered her descent into darkness, her arrival on the banks of the River Styx, and her consciousness began to slip. Hazel? Frank asked. Slip, sliding away, Ella muttered. Number five, US single, Paul Simon. Frank, go with her. Simon says, Frank, go with her. Hazel had no idea what Ella was talking about, but her vision darkened as she clung to Frank's hand. She found herself back in the underworld, and this time, Frank was at her side. They stood in Karen's boat, Across the sticks, debris swirled in the dark waters, a deflated birth birthday balloon, a child's dummy, a little plastic bride and groom from the top of a cake, all the remnants of human lives cut short. W where are we? Frank stood at her side, shimmering with a ghostly purple light, as if he'd become a la. It's my past. Hazel felt, felt strangely calm. It's just an echo, don't worry. The boatman turned and grinned. One moment he was a handsome African man in an expensive silk suit. The next moment he was a skeleton in a dark robe. Of course you shouldn't worry, he said with a British accent. He addressed Hazel as if he couldn't see Frank at all. Told you I'd take you across, didn't I? It's all right, you don't have a coin. We wouldn't be proper, leaving Pluto's daughter on the wrong side of the river. The boat slid onto a dark beach. Hazel led Frank to the black gates of Erebos. The spirits parted for them, sensing she was a child of Pluto. The giant three-headed dog Cerberus growled in the gloom, but he let them pass. Inside the gates, they walked into a large pavilion and stood before the judge's bench. Three black-robed figures in golden masks stared down at Hazel. Frank whimpered. Who? They'll decide my fate, she said. Watch. Just as before, the judges asked her no questions. They simply looked into her mind, pulling thoughts from her head and examining them, examining them like a collection of old photos. Thwarted Gaia, the first judge said. Prevented Alsonius from waking. But she raised the giant in the first place, the second judge argued. Guilty of cowardice, weakness. She is young, said the third judge. Her mother's life hung in the balance. My mother. Hazel found the courage to speak. Where is she? What is her fate? The judges regarded her, their golden masks frozen in creepy smiles. Your mother. The image of Marie Levesque shimmered above the judges. She was frozen in time, hugging Hazel as the cave collapsed. 
her eyes shut tight. An interesting question, the second judge said. The division of fault. Yes, said the first judge. The child died for a noble cause. She prevented many deaths by delaying the giant's rise. She had courage to stand against the might of Gaia. But she acted too late, the third, third judge said sadly. She is guilty of aiding and abetting an enemy of the gods. The mother influenced her, said the first judge. The child can have Elysium. Eternal punishment for Mar Marie Levesque. No, Hazel shouted. No, please. That's not fair. The judges tilted their heads in unison. Gold masks, Hazel thought. Gold has always been cursed for me. She wondered if the gold was poisoning their thoughts somehow, so that they'd never give her a fair trial. Beware, Hazel Levesque, the first judge warned. Would you take full responsibility? You could lay this guilt on your mother's soul. That would be reasonable. You were destined for great things. Your mother diverted your path. See what you might have been. Another image appeared above the judges. Hazel saw herself as a little girl, grinning with her hands covered in finger paint. The image aged. Hazel saw herself growing up. Her hair became longer, her eyes sadder. She saw herself on her thirteenth birthday, riding across the fields on her borrowed horse. Sammy laughed as he raced after her. What are you running from? I'm not that ugly, am I? She saw herself in Alaska, trudging down Third Street in the snow and darkness on her way home from school. Then the image aged even more. Hazel saw herself at twenty. She looked so much like her mother, her hair gathered back in braids, her golden eyes flashing with amusement. She wore a white dress. A wedding dress? She was smiling so warmly. Hazel knew instinctively she must be looking at someone special, someone she loved. The sight didn't make her feel bitter. She didn't even wonder whom she would have married. Instead, she thought, my mother might have looked like this if she'd got out of her, got let go of her anger, if Gaia hadn't twisted her. You lost this life, the first judge said simply. Special circumstances, Elysium for you, punishment for your mother. No, Hazel said. No, it wasn't all her fault. She was misled. She loved me. At the end, she tried to protect me. Hazel, Frank whispered, what are you doing? She squeezed his hand, urging him to be silent. The judges paid him no attention. Finally, the second judge sighed. No resolution. Not enough good, not enough evil. The blame must be divided, the first judge agreed. Both souls will be consigned to the fields of Asphodel. I'm sorry, Hazel Levesque. You could have been a hero. She passed through the pavilion, into yellow fields that went on forever. She led Frank through a crowd of spirits to a grove of black poplar trees. You gave up Elysium, Frank said in amazement, so your mother wouldn't suffer. She didn't deserve punishment, Hazel said. But what happens now? Nothing, Hazel said. Nothing. For all eternity. They drifted aimlessly. Spirits around them chattered like bats, lost and confused, not remembering their past or even their names. Hazel remembered everything. Perhaps that was because she was a daughter of Pluto, but she never forgot who she was or why she was there. Remembering made my afterlife harder, she told Frank, who still drifted next to her as a glowing purple lar. So many times I tried to walk to my father's palace. She pointed to a large black castle in the distance. I could never reach it. I can't leave the fields of Asphodel. Did you ever see your mother again? Hazel shook her head. She wouldn't know me. Even if I could find her, these spirits, it's like an eternal dream for them, an endless trance. This is the best I could do for her. Time was meaningless, but after an eternity, she and Frank sat together under a black poplar tree, listening to the screams from the fields of punishment. In the distance, under the artificial sunlight of Elysium, the Isles of the Blessed glittered like emeralds in a sparkling blue lake. White sails cut across water, and the souls of great heroes basked on the beaches in perpetual bliss. You didn't deserve Asphodel. Frank protested. You should be with the heroes. This is just an echo, Hazel said. We'll wake up, Frank. It only seems like forever. That's not the point, he protested. Your life has taken... Well, it was taken from you. You were going to grow up to be a beautiful woman. You... His face turned a darker shade of purple. You were going to marry someone, he said quietly. You would have had a good life. You lost all that. Hazel swallowed back a sob. It hadn't been this hard in Asphodel the first time, when she was on her own. Having Frank with her made her feel so much sadder, but she was determined not to get angry about her fate. Hazel thought about that image of herself as an adult, smiling and in love. She knew it wouldn't take much bitterness to sour her expression and make her look exactly like Queen Marie. I deserve better, her mother always said. Hazel couldn't allow herself to feel that way. I'm sorry, Frank, she said. I think your mother was wrong. Sometimes sharing a problem doesn't make it easier to carry. 
but it does. Frank slipped his hand into his coat pocket. In fact, since we've got eternity to talk, there's something I want to tell you. He brought out an object wrapped in cloth, about the same size as a pair of glasses. When he unfolded it, Hazel saw a half-burnt piece of driftwood, glowing with purple light. She frowned. What is? Then the truth hit her, as cold and harsh as a blast of winter wind. Phineas said your life depends on a burnt stick. It's true, Frank said. This is my lifeline, literally. He told her how the goddess Juno had appeared when he was a baby, how his grandmother had snatched the piece of wood from the fireplace. Grandmother said I had gifts, some talent we got from an, an, an ancestor, the Argonaut. The, that and, and my dad's being Mars, he shrugged. I'm supposed to be too powerful or something. That's why my life can burn up so easily. Iris said I would die holding this, watching it burn. Frank turned the piece of tinder in his fingers. Even in his ghostly purple form, he looked so big and sturdy. Hazel figured he would be huge when he was an adult, as strong and healthy as an ox. She couldn't believe his life depended on something as small as a stick. Frank, how can you carry it around with you? She asked. Aren't you terrified something will happen to it? That's why I'm telling you. He held out the firewood. I know it's a lot to ask, but would you keep it for me? Hazel's head spun. Until now, she'd accepted Frank's present in her blackout. She'd led him along, numbly replaying her past, because it seemed only fair to show him the truth. But now she wondered if Frank was really experiencing this with her, or if she was just imagining his presence. Why would he trust her with his life? Frank, she said, you know who I am. I'm Pluto's daughter. Everything I touch goes wrong. Why would you trust me? You're my best friend. He placed the firewood in her hands. I trust you more than anybody. She wanted to tell him he was making a mistake. She wanted to give it back. But before she could say anything, a shadow fell over them. Our ride is here, Frank guessed. Hazel had almost forgotten she was reliving her past. Nico D'Angelo stood over her in his black overcoat, his Tegean iron sword at his side. He didn't notice Frank, but he locked eyes with Hazel and seemed to read her whole life. You're different, he said, a child of Pluto. You remember your past. Yes, Hazel said, and you're alive. Nico studied her like he was reading a menu, deciding whether or not to order. I'm Nico D'Angelo, he said. I came looking for my sister. Death has gone missing, so I thought, I thought I could bring her back and no one would notice. Back to life, Hazel asked. Is that possible? It should have been, Nico sighed, but she's gone. She chose to be reborn into a new life. I'm too late. I'm sorry. He held out his hand. You're my sister too. You deserve another chance. Come with me. Chapter 30. Hazel. Hazel. Percy was shaking her shoulder. Wake up, we've reached Seattle. She sat up groggily, squinting in the morning sunlight. Frank? Frank groaned, rubbing his eyes. Did we just... Was I just... You both passed out, Percy said. I don't know why, but Ella told me not to worry about it. She said you were... Sharing. Sharing, Ella agreed. She crouched in the stern, preening her wing feathers with her teeth, which didn't look like a very effective form of personal hygiene. She spat out some red fluff. Sharing is good. No more blackouts. Biggest American blackout, 14th of August, 2003. Hazel shared. No more blackouts. Percy scratched his head. Yeah, we've been having conversations like that all night. I still don't know what she's talking about. Hazel pressed her hand against her coat pocket. She could feel the piece of firewood wrapped in cloth. She looked at Frank. You were there. He nodded. He didn't say anything, but his expression was clear. He'd meant what he said. He wanted her to keep the piece of tinder safe. She wasn't sure whether she felt honoured or scared. No one had ever trusted her with something so important. Wait, Percy said. You mean you guys shared a blackout? Are you guys both going to pass out from now on? Nope, Ella said. Nope, nope, nope. No more blackouts. More books for Ella. Books in Seattle. Hazel gazed over the water. They were sailing through a large bay, making their way towards a cluster of downtown buildings. Neighbourhoods rolled across a series of hills. From the tallest one rose an odd white tower with a saucer on the top, like a spaceship from the old Flash Gordon movies Sammy used to love. No more blackouts, Hazel thought. After enduring them for so long, the idea seemed too good to be true. How could Ella be so sure that they were gone? Yet Hazel did feel different, more grounded, as if she wasn't trying to live in some two time periods anymore. Every muscle in her body began to relax. She felt as if she'd finally slipped out of a lead jacket she'd been wearing for months. Somehow, having Frank with her during the blackout had helped. She'd relived her entire past right through to the present. Now all she had to worry about was the future, assuming she had one. Percy steered the boat towards the downtown docks. 
As they got closer, Ella scratched nervously at her nest of books. Hazel started to feel edgy too. She wasn't sure why. It was a bright sunny day and Seattle looked like a beautiful place, with inlets and bridges, wooded islands dotting the bay, and snow-capped mountains rising in the distance. Still, she felt as if she was being watched. Um, why are we stopping here? she asked. Percy showed them the silver ring on his necklace. Raina has a sister here. She asked me to find her and show her this. Raina has a sister? Frank asked, like the idea terrified him. Percy nodded. Apparently Raina thinks her sister could send help for the camp. Amazons. Ella muttered. Amazon country. Hmm. Ella will find libraries instead. Doesn't like Amazons. Fierce. Shields. Swords. Pointy. Ouch. Frank reached for his spear. Amazons. Like female warriors. That would make sense, Hazel said. If Raina's sister is also a daughter of Bologna, I can see why she joined the Amazons. But is it safe for us to be here? Nope, nope, nope. Ella said. Get books instead. No Amazons. We have to try, Percy said. I promised Raina. Besides, the pax isn't doing too great. I've been pushing it pretty hard. Hazel looked down at her feet. Water was leaking between the floorboards. Oh. Yeah, Percy agreed. We'll either need to fix it or find a new boat. I'm pretty much holding it together with my willpower at this point. Ella, do you have any idea where we can find the Amazons? And, um, Frank said nervously, they don't like, uh, kill men on sight, do they? Ella glanced at the downtown docks, only a few hundred yards away. Ella will find friends later. Ella will fly away now. And she did. Well, Frank picked a single red feather out of the air. That's encouraging. They docked at the wharf. They barely had time to unload their supplies before the pack shuddered and broke into pieces. Most of it sank, leaving only a board with a painted eye and another with the letter P bobbing in the waves. Guess we're not fixing it, Hazel said. What now? Percy stared at the steep hills of downtown Seattle. We hope the Am Amazons will help. They explored for hours. They found some great salty caramel chocolate at a candy store. They bought some coffee to str so strong Hazel's head felt like a vibrating gong. They stopped at a sidewalk cafe, had some excellent grilled salmon sandwiches. Once they saw Ella zooming between high-rise towers, a large book clutched in each foot, but they found no Amazons. All the while, Hazel was aware of the time ticking by, 22nd of June now, and Alaska was still a long way away. Finally, they wandered south of downtown into a plaza surrounded by smaller glass and brick buildings. Hazel's nerves started tingling. She looked around, sure she was being watched. There, she said. The office building on their left had a single word etched on the glass door. Amazon. Oh, Frank said. Oh, uh, uh, no, Hazel. That's a modern thing. They're a company, right? They sell stuff on the internet. They're not actually Amazons. Unless. Percy walked through the doors. Hazel had a big bad feeling about this place, but she and Frank followed. The lobby was like an empty fish tank, glass walls and glossy black floor, a few token plants and pretty much nothing else. Against the back wall, a black stone staircase led up and down. In the middle of the room stood a young woman in a black pantsuit with long auburn hair and a security guard's earpiece. Her name tag said Kinsey. Her smile was friendly enough, but her eyes reminded Hazel of the policeman in New Orleans. who used to patrol the French Quarter at night. They always seem to look through you as if they were thinking about who might attack them next. Kinsey nodded at Hazel, ignoring the boys. May I help you? Um, I hope so, Hazel said. We're looking for Amazons. Kinsey glanced at Hazel's sword, then Frank's spear, though neither should have been visible through the mist. This is the main campus for Amazon, she said cautiously. Did you have an appointment with someone or... Hiller, Percy interrupted. We're looking for a girl named... Kinsey moved so fast, Hazel's eyes almost couldn't follow. She kicked Frank in the chest, sent him flying backwards across the lobby. She pulled a sword out of thin air, swept Percy off his feet with the flat of the blade and pressed the point under his chin. Too late. Hazel reached for her sword. A dozen more girls in black flooded up the staircase, swords in hand and surrounded her. Kinsey glared down at Percy. First rule, males don't speak without permission. Second rule, trespassing on our territory is punishable by death. You'll meet Queen Hiller. All right, she'll be the one deciding your fate. The Amazons confiscated the trio's weapons and marched them down so many flights of stairs that Hazel lost count. Finally, they emerged in a cavern so big it could have accommodated ten high schools, sports fields and all. Stark fluorescent lights glowed along the rock ceiling. Conveyor belts wound through the room like water slides, carrying boxes in every direction. Aisles of metal shelves stretched out forever, stacked high with crates of merchandise. Cranes hummed and robotic arms whirred, folding cardboard boxes, packing shipments and taking things on and off the belts. 
Some of the shelves were so tall, they were only accessible by ladders and catwalks, which ran across the ceiling, like theatre scaffolding. Hazel remembered newsreels she'd seen as a child. She'd always been impressed by the scenes of factories, building planes and guns for the war effort. Hundreds and hundreds of weapons coming off the line every day. But that was nothing compared to this, and almost all the work was being done by computers and robots. The only humans Hazel could see were some black-suited security women patrolling the catwalks, and some men in orange jumpsuits like prison uniforms driving forklifts through the aisles, delivering some pallets of boxes. The men wore iron collars round their necks. You keep slaves. Hazel knew it might be dangerous to speak, but she was so outraged she couldn't stop herself. The men, Kinsey snorted. They're not slaves. They just know their place. Now move. They walked so far that Hazel's feet began to hurt. She thought they must surely be getting to the end of the warehouse when Kinsey opened a large set of double doors and led them into another cavern, just as big as the first. The underworld isn't this big, Hazel complained, which probably wasn't true, but it felt that way to her feet. Kinsey smiled smugly. You admire our base of operations? Yes, our distribution system is worldwide. It took many years and most of our fortune to build. Now, finally, we're turning a profit. The mortals don't realise they are funding the Amazon kingdom. Soon, we'll be richer than any mortal nation. Then, when the weak mortals depend on us for everything, the revolution will begin. What are you going to do? Frank grumbled. Cancel free shipping? A guard slammed the hilt of her sword into his gut. Percy tried to help him, but two more guards pushed him back at sword point. You'll learn respect, Kinsey said. It's males like you who have ruined the mortal world. The only harmonious society is one run by women. We are stronger, wiser, more humble, Percy said. The guards tried to hit him, but Percy ducked. Stop it, Hazel said. Surprisingly, the guards listened. Hilla is going to judge us, right? Hazel asked. So take us to her. We're wasting time. Kinsey nodded. Perhaps you're right. We have more important problems and time. Time is definitely an issue. What do you mean? Hazel asked. A guard grunted. We could take them straight to Otrera. Might win her favour that way. No, Kinsey snarled. I'll sooner wear an iron collar and drive a forklift. Hilla is queen. Until tonight, another guard muttered. Kinsey gripped her sword. For a second, Hazel thought the Amazons might start fighting one another, but Kinsey seemed to get her anger under control. Enough, she said. Let's go. They crossed a lane of forklift traffic, navigated a maze of conveyor belts, and ducked under a row of robotic arms that were packing up boxes. Most of the merchandise looked pretty ordinary. Books, electronics, baby diapers... But against one wall sat a war chariot with a big barcode on the side. Hanging from the yoke was a sign that read, Only one left in stock. Order soon. More on the way. Finally, they entered a small cavern that looked like a combination loading zone and throne room. The walls were lined with metal shelves, six stories high, decorated with war banners, painted shields and the stuffed heads of dragons, hydras, giant lions and wild boars. Standing guard along either side were dozens of forklifts, modified for war. An iron-collared male drove each machine, but an Amazon warrior stood on a platform at the back, manning a giant mounted crossbow. The prongs of each forklift had been sharpened into oversized sword blades. The shelves in this room were stacked with cages containing live animals. Hazel couldn't believe what she was seeing. Black mastiffs, giant eagles, a lion-eagle hybrid that must have been a griffin, and a red ant the size of a compact car. She watched in horror as a forklift zipped into the room, picked up a cage with a beautiful white pegasus and sped away while the horse whinnied in protest. What are you doing to that poor animal? Hazel demanded. Kinsey frowned. The pegasus? It'll be fine. Someone must have ordered it. The shipping and handling charges are steep, but... You can buy a pegasus online? Percy asked. Kinsey glared at him. Obviously you can't mail, but Amazons can. We have followers all over the world. They need supplies. This way... At the end of the warehouse was a dace constructed from pallets of books, stacks of vampire novels, walls of Jane Patterson, James Patterson thrillers, and a throne made from about a thousand copies of something called The Five Habits of Highly Aggressive Women. At the base of the steps, several Amazons in camouflage were having a heated argument while a young woman, Queen Hiller, Hazel assumed, watched and listened from her throne. Hiller was in her twenties, lithe and lean as a tiger. She wore a black leather jumpsuit and black boots. She had no crown, but round her waist was a strange belt made of interlocking gold links, like the pattern of a labyrinth. Hazel couldn't believe how much she looked like Raina, a little older perhaps, but with the same long black hair, the same dark eyes and the same hard expression, like she was trying to decide which of the Amazons before her most deserved death. Kinsey took one look at the argument 
and grunted with distaste. Ortrera's agents, spreading their lies. What? Frank asked. Then Hazel stopped so abruptly that the guards behind her stumbled, a few feet from the Queen's throne. Two Amazons guarded a cage. Inside was a beautiful horse, not the winged kind, but a majestic and powerful stallion with a honey-coloured coat and a black mane. His fierce brown eyes regarded Hazel, and she could swear he looked impatient, as if thinking, about time you got here. It's him, Hazel murmured. Him who? Percy asked. Kinsey scowled in annoyance. When she saw where Hazel was looking, her expression softened. Ah, yes, beautiful, isn't he? Hazel blinked to make sure she wasn't hallucinating. It was the same horse she'd chased in Alaska. She was sure of it, but that was impossible. No horse could live that long. Is he? Hazel could hardly control her voice. Is he for sale? The guards all laughed. That's Arian, Kinsey said patiently, as if she understood Hazel's fascination. He's a royal treasure of the Amazons, to be claimed only by the most courageous warrior, if you believe the prophecy. Prophecy? Hazel asked. Kinsey's expression became pained, almost embarrassed. Never mind, but no, he's not for sale. But then why is he in a cage? Kinsey grimaced. Because he is difficult. Right on cue, the horse slammed his head against the cage door. The metal bars shuddered and the guards retreated nervously. Hazel wanted to free that horse. She wanted it more than anything she had ever wanted before. But Percy Frank and a dozen Amazon guards were staring at her, so she tried to mask her emotions. Just asking, she managed. Let's see the Queen. The argument at the front of the room grew louder. Finally, the Queen noticed Hazel's group approaching, and she snapped. Enough! The arguing Amazons shut up immediately. The Queen waved them aside and beckoned Kinsey forward. Kinsey shoved Hazel and her friends towards the throne. My Queen, these demigods... The Queen shot to her feet. You! She glared at Percy Jackson with murderous rage. Percy muttered something in ancient Greek that Hazel was pretty sure the nuns at St Agnes wouldn't have liked. Clipboard, he said. Spa! Pirates! This made no sense to Hazel, but the Queen nodded. She stepped down from her dace of bestsellers and drew a dagger from her belt. You were incredibly foolish to come here, she said. You destroyed my home. You made my sister and me exiles and prisoners. Percy, Frank said uneasily, what's the scary woman with the dagger talking about? Circe's Island, Percy said. I just remembered. The Gorgon's blood. Maybe it's starting to heal my mind. The Sea of Monsters. Hilla. She welcomed us at the docks, took us to see her boss. Hilla worked for the sorceress. Hilla bared her perfect white teeth. Are you telling me you've had amnesia? You know I might actually believe you. Why else would you be stupid enough to come here? We've come in peace, Hazel insisted. What did Percy do? Peace! The Queen raised her eyebrows at Hazel. What did he do? This male destroyed Circe's school of magic. Circe turned me into a guinea pig, Percy protested. No excuses, Hilla said. Circe was a wise and generous employer. I had room and board and a good health plan. Dental, pet leopards, free potions, everything. And this demigod with his friend, the blonde Annabeth. Percy snapped his forehead like he wanted the memories to come back faster. That's right. I was there with Annabeth. You released our captives, Blackbeard and his pirates. She turned to Hazel. Have you ever been kidnapped by pirates? It isn't fun. They burned our spa to the ground. My sister and I were their prisoners for months. Fortunately, we were daughters of Bologna. We learned to fight quickly. If we hadn't, she shuddered. Well, the pirates learned to respect us. Eventually, we made our way to California where we... She hesitated as if the memory was painful. Where my sister and I parted ways. She stepped towards Percy until they were nose to nose. She ran her dagger under his chin. Of course, I survived and prospered. I have risen to be Queen of the Amazons, so perhaps I should thank you. You're welcome, Percy said. The Queen dug her knife in a little deeper. Never mind, I think I'll kill you. Wait, Hazel yelped. Raina sent us, your sister. Look at the ring on his necklace. Hilla frowned. She lowered her knife to Percy's necklace until the point rested on the silver, silver ring. The colour drained from her face. Explain this, she glared at Hazel. Quickly. Hazel tried. She described Camp Jupiter. She told the Amazons about Raina being their praetor and the army of monsters that, they was, that were marching south. She told them about their quest to free Fanatos in Alaska. As Hazel talked, another group of Amazons entered the room. One was taller and older than the rest, with plaited silver hair and fine silk robes like a Roman matron. The other Amazons made way for her, treating her with such respect that Hazel wondered if she was Hilla's mother, until she noticed how Hilla and the older woman stared daggers at each other. So we need your help, 
Hazel finished her story. Raina needs your help. Hiller gripped Percy's leather cord and yanked it off his neck. Beads, ring, probatio tablet and all. Raina, that foolish girl. Well, the old woman interrupted. Romans need our help. She laughed and the Amazon, Amazons around her joined in. How many times did we battle the Romans in my day? The woman asked. How many times have they killed our sisters in battle when I was queen? Or Trera? Hiller interrupted. You are here as a guest. You are not queen anymore. The older woman spread her hands and made a mocking bow. As you say, at least until tonight. But I speak the truth, Queen Hiller. She said the word like a taunt. I've been brought back by the Earth Mother herself. I bring tidings of a new war. Why would Amazons follow Jupiter, that foolish king of Olympus, when we can follow a queen, when I take command? If you take command, Hiller said. But for now, I am queen. My word is law. I see. Otrera looked at the assembled Amazons, who were standing very still, as if they found themselves in a pit with two wild tigers. Have we become so weak that we listen to male demigods? Will you spare the life of this son of Neptune, even though he once destroyed your home? Perhaps you'll let him destroy your new home, too. Hazel held her breath. The Amazons looked back and forth between Hilla and Otrera, watching for any sign of weakness. I will pass judgment, Hilla said in an icy tone. Once I have all the facts, that is how I rule. By reason, not fear. First I will talk with this one. She jabbed a finger towards Hazel. It is my duty to hear, hear out a female warrior before I sentence her or her allies to death. That is the Amazon way. Or have your years in the underworld muddled your memory, Otrera? The older woman sneered, but she didn't try to argue. Hiller turned to Kinsey. Take these males to the holding cells. The rest of you, leave us. Otrera raised her hand to the crowd, as our queen commands, but any of you who would like to hear more about Gaia and our glorious future with her, come with me. About half the Amazons followed her out of the room. Kinsey snorted with disgust, and then she and her guards hauled Percy and Frank away. Soon, Hiller and Hazel were alone except for the queen's personal guards. At Hiller's signal, even they moved out of earshot. The queen turned towards Hazel. Her anger dissolved, and Hazel saw desperation in her eyes. The queen looked like one of her caged animals being whisked off on a conveyor belt. We must talk, Hiller said. We don't have much time. By midnight, I will most likely be dead.